Hi, I'm David Allen Patali, and I'm here to read an extract of my taboo novel, Locust Summer, for you. It's great to have the opportunity to share the work with you. It's out from Fremantle Press right now. And uh, the book itself was shortlisted for the Vogel in 2017, which led to it being selected for a fellowship at Varuna, the National Writers' House in the Blue Mountains in Sydney, where I had a, a really great creative time uh, developing this book. So got a bit of a Western Sydney connection there, so I'm really pleased to be able to share it with you today. I'm going to read an extract for you from the very middle of the book. Uh, the book itself is about the Brockman family, particularly the main character called Rowan Brockman, who's a journalist in Perth in the 80s, who moves back to his family farm for what becomes the final harvest of the property because his father is dying of dementia. His brother was killed in a mining accident and his mother has decided to sell the family farm. This is a coming of age story uh, and a, I guess a homecoming story, but it doesn't really go the way these stories uh, often do. So I'd like to read chapter 20 for you today. The weeping willow on the front lawn swayed in a breeze. Utes crept up and down the paddock tracks. Clouds of dust wafted over the wheat stubble. After checking the home paddocks again, I went back to the homestead to look under the veranda, in the cupboards, in the library, the laundry, the bedrooms, madly thinking he'd been overlooked as part of the furniture. The CB in the empty kitchen crackled with reports that all amounted to the same thing. There was still no sign of him. Dusk was approaching. I felt detached as though a fever was ballooning my senses. Sweat circled my head, my breathing became ragged, and I had to hold on to the kitchen counter till dizziness passed. Then I knew it, typed bold as a headline. Dad was at the boulder. The outcrop of ancient granite in the hot paddocks had been so, had been, he had been so drawn to the other day, where he'd been so vivid with his old way of being, steeped in recollection, a place where perhaps he could remember himself, tap into that seam of knowledge and enthusiasm that he had so rarely burst through with in his sickness, bright and sure, making us feel for a moment truly in his presence again. I'll get a dinner on, Mum said, bustling into the kitchen with Mrs Chambers at her heels. Get on the radio and tell everyone to come up for something to eat. It's going to be dark soon. She clattered pots and pans in a quick mise en place, and whacked a pair of lamb sirloins in the oven with a splash of olive oil and rosemary. I made my mind small and focused on making orders, one word in front of the other, bolting them together with the nonchalance of a council worker. Searchers at Brockman's place, this is Rowan at the homestead, come up for something to eat when the light goes. We can resume with torches and floodlights afterward, over and out. Call made, mum satisfied, I went outside where the falling light made bas reliefs of the garden trees and turned the paddocks into distant seas. The sound of engines approaching was all around and faint voices continued to call Dad's name, pushing its alliteration, Bryce Brockman, across the fields. They were looking in the wrong place. I was sure of it. I fired up the ute and drove along the driveway till I saw a pair of headlights shining through the sentinel pine trees. I slowed to a crawl, wound my window down and saw Sturlow at the other wheel. He looked wired, like someone who'd stayed up past the need to sleep. Where are you off to? Didn't you say to come back? I'm searching the back paddock again, I said. It won't take long. Save me something, will you? We'll find him, Sterlo said, hook or by crook. We won't stop. Your mother can cook all she likes. No one's going in. I waved him off and planted my foot on the accelerator. The whine of the turbo brought a memory of summer of Dad fanging a rented four-wheel drive through sand dunes close to a big shack we'd rented. Don't tell your mother, he said to us boys, and Albie and I promised, happy to share some danger together, thrilled to break the rules. Simple science driving on sand, he'd say. Keep the revs up and don't let the wheels stop. On the highway, driving to the rock, the sound of waves came humming past the spattered bodies of locusts on the windshield, drawing me deeper into times when nothing was lost. The sky was full of pure white clouds with the sun's pale fire painted at their edges. The tide went out, waves flattened and the sea breeze withered to a caress. Albert, me, mum and dad, we all walked together on the sandy flats looking for something interesting to scoop into a bucket. Shells and squid cartilage, old glass polished into cloudy jewels, 
anything we could string onto fishing lines and make a wind chime with for the garden. Maybe we'll find a message in a bottle, Dad said, grabbing me around the waist, hoisting me onto his shoulders as though I didn't weigh a thing. I looked down at Albert and waved, a king on a sedan chair, and he ran up and jumped at me, missing and laughing, coming after us, begging Mum to hoist him up. You're too heavy, Albie, why don't you pick me up? In a flash, he did. Scooped Mum up with fireman's strength and put her on his shoulders. Come on then, fight, he cried, and came at me and Dad. First one down does the dishes for a week. Push and pull and twist and shout, an almighty battle of hands and arms and legs. Mum smiled like I had never seen her smile before. So I let her win. She pulled me from Dad's shoulders and I fell to the ground, where Albert kicked a wave of sand over my chest to mark the victory. And off they went down the beach, my brother running as fast as he could go with Mum on his shoulders, swishing her right arm behind her like a jockey. Better luck next time, mate, Dad said. It always pays to hold on tight. We walked together in the warm shallows, away from Mum and Albert, heading back to the shack in the dune where our dinner was bubbling in the oven, a red sauce for crabs we'd catch at dusk. Why journalism, he said. I thought you'd do a commerce degree, something political and dry. I had a line well practised. If I'm going to do hack work, I want to be paid poorly for it. He nudged me with his shoulder, pushing me into the path of water rising up to the sand. You can always come back for the harvest. Earn a few bob for the summer. To know, Dad, I'll have exams probably, work experience to do, you know? Fine enough, but the offer stands. He stopped and picked up a rock, threw it into the sea where it skipped once, twice and thrice. It's nice to forget about the place for a few weeks anyway. It's good here. Timeless. He picked up another rock and hurled it far out to the flat sea, where it kicked a single splash. You can always come back, he said and fetched another. There he was, as if in a painting. Man on the rock, distinct to the dark, as the headlights washed over his arms and legs, and face and hands, yellow pyjamas, black leather slippers and white skin. He was sitting in the pose of a thinker, looking out over paddocks lit by the moon and the Milky Way. I killed the engine and the lights and climbed up there after him, finding the way by easy instinct. Up on top, I sat beside him, said nothing. There are only a handful of moments I can truly say that the whole of my attention was focused, where no stray ounce of feeling was on autopilot rendered of any distraction. Up there, on the rock, the ticking of all the clocks stopped. A great bubble of calm projected out, and made a new country that only I could see. Bulldozers skimmed their blades across the topsoil to make foundations for housing estates rising into the naked sun. An apartment block towered where Brockman's place once stood. The whole of Septimus was gaveled to developers who turned it into a retirement village and a brace of starter homes. Suburbs expanded up the coast from Perth to Geraldton. Bobcats felled bankshires and grass trees and mulched the salt bush while ditch witches sucked the scum from sewage pipes, the veins of progress making the soil into weathered skin. And at the source, a great tower rose and put my apartment in Scarborough in shadow, a spear of the Gold Coast planting its roots on a western beach. When I was a young man, this was all bush, Dad said. The Hoths hired some Italians to clear the scrub for a few bob a week to expand their holdings. So they diverted the creek bed and chopped down the big trees for firewood and hacked the rest out with axes and crowbars and chains. It took a good three months to get this paddock into a billiard table. They had to leave the rocks, of course. This is just the latest they've revealed. He patted the boulder between us. What brings you here, mate? You from the harvest crew? I'm a last minute addition, I said, knowing to play along. I know all about them, Dad said, smiling at me as if to make a friend. My family's been on this land for generations, right back to the days of John Septimus Rowe and the expeditions to map the potential of the state. We're rusted on. He checked over his shoulder and then leaned in, a mate of mine told me when he went to France and saw their farmland, blood fair rushed to his head. And he says he picked up a sod of the black soil and had a pinch of it. He could chew the minerals, you know. Think of all the centuries of death and decay and the millennia of life all churned into it. What do we have here? Sand, gravel, drought. God knows what they saw in this place when they clapped eyes on it. He put on a posh accent. Oh, this would make jolly fine farms. All we have to do is run the natives off, cut down the scrub and find some 
fools to do all the work for pittance. He paused a while, then stood slowly, turning in a circle. If I had my way, I'd let it all go fallow. Let the bush reclaim it. We've got no business being here. He looked down at me. You got a cigarette, mate? I did, and lit two. We smoked in silence, sharing the view, and I kept a hand on the boulder to steady my balance as the world spun faster and faster, louder and louder, till I felt like a rock tumbling through the air. Thank you for listening to my reading of Locust Summer. It's out through Fremantle Press. And if you pick it up, I hope you enjoy reading it as much as I enjoyed writing it. Thank you.